Okay, so we have an exciting class today because we're going to jump right into visualization in R. And we're going to use some breast can cancer transcriptome data that I prepared for you. Okay, so the plan today is as follows. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about breast cancer, both from a clinical and molecular perspective. My feeling is that, you know, you get a lot more out of data science and bioinformatics if you understand where your data set's coming from, and you can ask much deeper, more meaningful questions and maybe discover something uh, truly important. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about what transcriptomes are um, and why um, we uh, study the transcriptomes. And then um, that's, that's enabled by um, uh, sequencing technology, specifically next generation sequencing, um, which is sometimes called sequencing by synthesis. Uh, and Illumina is a specific company that is often used in research context, at least. And our data is Illumina. So we'll talk a little bit about the genomics there. And then I'm going to talk about the, the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA. Um, this is basically a large uh, U.S. effort to profile um, tumors of all different types of cancers. And then we're going to get into a um, data set that I prepared from TCGA that I made small because we don't need the full range of um, uh, data types and um, information that's available there to keep it sort of simple for us to start with. And then I'm going to show in our studio uh, our how to um, do some nice exploration. OK, so uh, clinical perspective of breast cancer. OK, so. It's the most commonly diagnosed cancer among Canadian women. Um, something, a cancer like uh, skin cancer, a melanoma, is probably more prevalent in the population, but uh, it's not often diagnosed. 25% um, of all cancers in women, uh, breast cancers, one in nine women will have breast cancer in their lifetime. So you can reflect on that a bit because, you know, everybody in the class has a mother and two grandmothers. On average, you might have one sister, I would say, probably, right? So uh, that's already four women. And then, um, you know, once you add in your aunts and nieces, and uh, you're quickly at nine women that you know very directly. And so li likely um, uh, there's a chance, a good chance, that one in those of those women will, will have breast cancer sometime in their lifetime. It's the second leading cause of death from cancer. Uh, individual breast cancer cases are not particularly deadly, but it, because it's so prevalent at 27,400 cases in 2020 in Canada, um, you do get quite a few breast cancer deaths, so five, over 5,000 last year. Men do get breast cancer, but it's not that common. Okay, so... Um, we're interested here, actually my lab's been interested in ductal breast carcinoma and the data set we're going to see today is a, a ductal breast carcinoma data set for the most part. So um, this is a, a picture of uh, a cartoon of, um, the, uh, of the epithelial milk secreting cells in the, in the lobe or the duct of a, of a breast, right? And this is what one of the functions of the breast is to produce milk, which then goes down the duct, uh, um, out of the lobe, down the duct, and into uh, eventually to the nipple for the baby. Um, uh, ductal breast carcinomas are believed to begin in the cells that um, that uh, comprise the duct. Okay, so this is a um, immunohistochemistry staining here. Uh, the BM stands for basement membrane, so it's like a, um, a shield around the cells uh, in here. This is, uh, to, to keep this in perspective, is that what the, what the perspective is here is that you'd slice the duct here and you're looking down the duct. So this is where the milk would flow. And these cells here is where the breast cancer is thought to originate. And um, that, that's, that includes myopithelial cells, some breast progenitor cells. And the luminal epithelial cell is very important. Um, and then outside of that, you have the breast tumor microenvironment, which consists of adipocytes, collagen, and vasculature, etc. Okay. 
so um, well you know there is a concept of um, tumor progression and rest and uh, again so we believe in a ductal carcinoma the um, cancers originating in um, one of the cells along the duct wall uh, inside the duct wall and usually um, well, what we believe is that uh, that one cell um, becomes abnormal or so for, for example it becomes hyperplastic so it starts to grow in a kind of uncontrolled way it loses its uh, the, the cells here lose their nice compact morphology um, because uh, the cells aren't growing in a very regulated way um, first uh, they um, one model is that the cells uh, are believed to first you know, fill up the duct, and that's called an in situ breast cancer. Um, so basically, they just invade into that place where the milk is, and, and many women have this ductal in situ breast cancer. And um, it, it in itself is not considered life threatening at this point because it's still contained with the duct. It will cause inflammation and pain in women, it'll cause discomfort, and um, uh, eventually the woman will notice it. Or, diagnosed with it and it's treated actually very aggressively in the clinic but um, uh, and that's just that's to basically stave off the ability for it to become what's called invasive which means that it breaks through this basement membrane and and leaks or spreads invades into the surrounding microenvironment into those adipocytes and fibroblasts etc and and then after it becomes um, after it's uh, established invasiveness it then breaks out of the tumor or the mammary um, tissue and into the blood vascular which blood and uh, vasculature for example or the lymphatics where it then spreads to other organs and it's at that point that um, a primary uh, a cancer that's derived from a primary breast tumor becomes like threatening because it goes to the liver the lungs the brain kidneys uh, etc so yeah that's the idea of tumor progression and um, the data set that we're looking at really has mostly invasive and some metastatic profiles in it other data sets that I didn't include here um, uh, uh, profile in situ and um, so-called benign uh, tumors and that's actually what my lab is quite interested in is those really early tumors Okay, so clinical oncologists have um, a large toolkit for assessing individuals that have been diagnosed with breast cancer. One of the classic methods is so-called TNM staging, tumor node metastases. Um, some of you who uh, have loved ones or friends that have had cancer uh, have heard the terms like stage zero, stage one, uh, and stage four, et cetera. And it's a little bit more complicated than that, and I won't go into all the details, but basically stage zero represents a sort of benign tumor stage where you'll see some dysplasia cells that are uh, under the microscope that don't look quite proper or the morphology of the tissue has been disrupted that moves towards the same tumor progression. So now, you know, it's, it's um, the stage one is that the tumor is still small, but it's contained within, say, the ducts moving or, um, or at least within locally within the breast and then moving towards stage four which is um, a full-blown metastatic uh, disease and certainly um, stage four is very bad news still to this day for many types of cancer once it spreads to different organs kidneys livers brain um, lungs it's very hard to treat and uh, you know, it's, it's um, uh, the drugs uh, and treatments at those late stages are often experimental and very toxic, etc. So if you're going to get cancer, you want to make sure that it gets treated early as possible and get rid of it uh, before it has a chance to expand, invade, and metastasize. But uh, clinicians have a, a, a variety of other ways to evaluate a breast tumor. So, for example, tumor grade, they look under the microscope to see how um, how much of the morphology of the cell has been lost, basically how weird the cell looks. The weirder it looks, the, the, it, it basically suggests that there's been a lot of um, genomic instability and neoplasticity. And that's a hallmark of cancer, in fact. 
that the genome changes, creating new genes with polymorphisms, fusion genes when two, uh, you know, genes come together uh, and sort of you know, fuse to become one gene that might have you know, very weird um, capacity in the uh, tissue. Uh, other techniques like um, uh, or markers like the proliferative index, so how quickly is the tumor growing? That tells them something about how aggressive the tumor is. But also there are some key proteins that have been known for breast cancer for a long time, maybe 30, 40 years, including the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and um, the human epidermal growth factor, HER2. Uh, these, these are classic ways that um, pathologists in particular have used to classify tumors. And that classification has, in turn, um, that 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 classification suggests what kind of drug or therapeutic av avenue would be appropriate for that individual. This information is also combined with um, information like uh, the age of the individual. A 90-year-old woman is not likely to be treated the same as a 40-year-old athlete um, who's in shape. Uh, um, lifestyle are they still smoking or not you know uh, alcohol um, other uh, other diseases um, a history of cancer etc all these things go into a um, uh, you know, the, the clinician's um, decision making and I, I don't pretend to know that at all um, from what I understand is that the treating molecular clinical oncologist meets with other clinical oncologists and they um, discuss each case and argue about what the appropriate therapy uh, should be and um, they take many of these things into consideration moving forward. Okay, so as I mentioned, certain proteins have been highlighted by years of research as fundamental for um, informing on the subtype of, uh, of a breast tumor. Um, immunohistochemistry, for example, is used to study the estrogen and progesterone receptors. Uh, usually, clinically, HER2 is studied using fish, fluorescence institute hybridization. Uh, and that's because fundamentally, um, HER2 is relevant because it becomes amplified in the genome. So it's a DNA level event where that gene in the region around it is copied many times, maybe 30 to 50 times in the individual. And so you get 30 to 50 times as much protein product. And because it's a growth factor, that's bad news. And we're going to look at HER2 and ER specifically today. Um, but at least for 30 years, these, these um, three proteins have been used as um, to basically decide how patients would be treated. Uh, because those three types, uh, th those different subtypes of tumor tumors have really different molecular um, portraits and that requires therefore different therapies different drugs that target different um, mechanisms in the cell so for example tamoxifen is is a, an established drug, drug for breast cancer uh, and it's used to target er positive tumors and, and classically um, herceptin was used to target her two positive tumors i mean nowadays there's actually some suggestion it may benefit in the ER-positive tumors, but that's a, a story for another day. Um, so, uh, yeah, Herceptin actually targets the HER2 protein, and um, Tamoxifen actually targets the estrogen receptor on this, uh, in the cell. So, um, knowing the subside, subtype of a tumor is really important for treating the individual properly. Um, but, well, you know, clinicians have for a long time known that breast cancer seems much more complicated and can't be captured solely by the ER and PR and HER2 status. And um, around 1999, 2000, uh, people started to do transcriptomics uh, or gene expression profiling of um, large collections of breast tumors. Uh, and, you know, today we're going to look at a little bit of that data. But the idea was that they would use this um, way of, of looking at all transcripts in a cell at the time of diagnosis of an, of a, of an individual, all the transcripts in, in breast cancer cells, in the tumor cells, 
and see if we could basically develop a, a more robust scheme for subtyping um, breast cancers. And then instead of maybe three or four categories, categories based on ER, PR, and HER2, maybe now we would have 10 categories or 20 or five. But each of those categories would then be treated differently in the clinic. And that's what's been happening really for the past 20 years. And here, um, this is a, a schema that I don't really expect you to understand at this point, but it's just for your interest sake, is that we know or we hypothesize relatively strongly that um, breast cancer has many different subtypes. And one's called the clot low, one is the basal-like, one is HER2 enriched. And then we have different shades of luminal or ER positive tumors. Um, all this to say is that um, uh, we're, um, the, 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 the use of genomics uh, and other systems biology techniques have given us a more robust idea uh, of what goes on in a tumor. And it's, we basically found that um, there are many, many genes, thousands of genes that this, that behave very differently between a, a tumor that's ER positive and a tumor that's HER2 positive. It almost doesn't really make sense to speak of breast cancer as a single disease. It's really a collection of many different, very distinct diseases. So those diseases are the different subtypes. Okay. And that leads to a concept that we'll talk later on in the course about, which is personalized medicine. So tailoring treatment to the individual tumor. The idea that everybody's tumor really is different in maybe subtle ways, but important ways. Um, I would highly recommend these slides from Daniel Viting at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. He does a great job looking at the history and how the technology works and some of the issues. Part two goes into single cell sequencing and some pretty new things that we're gonna catch up to at, uh, later on in our course. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go through the slides here, but I'm going to center one of them out here. Um, uh, and the technology, uh, the, sorry, the, the data that I showed today was derived using um, high seq technology. And well, um, certainly uh, it's important to know a little bit about what the sequencers actually do and how that relates to transcriptomics. Okay, so uh, I don't like to throw out big numbers because I don't think that they give you very much intuition, but we can agree that 2 billion whatever is, is a lot, right? So it produces 2 billion reads, whatever they are, and I'll show you in a second. I want you to remember that. And the second thing is that um, each of these reads is so-called paired end, okay? I need to remember that. And that they're between 150 and 250 nucleotides long. It takes a while to run this experiment five days, but that's not really relevant for our discussion here. Okay, so, um, yeah. Now, um, what is it that we want to do? Okay, so let's start there. We have, let's say, a collection of tumors, all right? And tumor one is a tumor, tumor two, and well, how many tumors do we have? In the uh, data set that I show you today, we have about 1,200 tumors at our disposal. And each of these tumors, that's a sample, has uh, a bunch of cells. And those cells are quite heterogeneous. They're different kinds. They're epithelial cells, but they're also um, endothelial cells. They're fibroblasts. They're um, immune cells. They're adipocytes, uh, you name it. You know, mammalian tissue, there's going to be lots of different kinds of cells. Now, um, we want to capture or we want to study what's happening, uh, what was happening in those tumors uh, at the moment they were harvested. And so whether it was from a biopsy or from surgery, that material was flash frozen or, um, or, or, or embedded in some sort of fancy paraffin. And now what we want to do is we want to take that material and we want to uh, extract the mRNA. So, you know, usually that would be like we would, you know, lyse the cells, get rid of the membrane, et cetera, somehow. And uh, that would free the mRNAs and we would capture all of the mRNAs from those cells. Okay. 
and we can think of them as kind of being a bag of, of mRNAs, right? And um, those mRNAs are coming from, um, well, maybe 20,000 or so different genes, okay? So um, now some genes um, may not be expressed at all, so they have no transcripts there, and other genes uh, may be um, highly expressed, so they are contributing many transcripts to that bag, okay? So uh, our goal really is to use the sequencer to estimate how many Uh, the number of transcripts per gene per sample, okay? And so what we have to do is convert these mRNAs into cDNA. So these mRNAs are converted to cDNAs, okay? And that gives us a similar bag of cDNA like, okay? And these libraries are then sent to the sequencer, okay? All right. Now, let me add a new slide here. Now, the sequencer is a machine, and you can think of it as reaching in randomly into this big, um, into a, if this is a sample, okay? This is maybe from tumor one, and this is our cDNA library um, for sample one, okay? Tumor one sample one. And so we can think of this as being a big bag of cDNAs derived from the mRNAs. Okay. And the sequencer reaches into that bag and it pulls out some transcript at random, like that. And now I can blow that transcript up and it's going to look like any kind of transcript. It's going to maybe have a poly A tail. It's going to have start, end, etc. you know, whatever. Um, and what the sequencer does, and this is the notion of read and specifically paired end read, is that it sequences about 150 to 200 base pairs here, okay? So that's 150 to 250 BP nucleotides. And then there's a linker, and it sequences another 150 to 250 base pairs, okay? So what this is, is like an ACGT... GT, whatever, 150 bear pairs long, and another one, uh, GGCA, blah, 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 and let's say they're both 250 base pairs, okay? And now, we, the sequencer gives that to us, okay? Now, we align that to the human genome. We go to the NCBI or some other database, we look at the human ge genome, like HG19 or something like that, and we align this read against the human genome, and we find that it aligns here. And this is inside gene, I don't know, 5. So now we realize that gene 5 has at least one transcript in that sample. Okay? Now, how many times does that process occur? So... How many times does the sequencer pull from that bag of um, transcripts? And the answer is that it does this about 1 billion times, okay? And each time, it will produce such a paired end read, okay, that is given to us as its sequence, and we align it, and we find where it matches in the human genome. And each time we find it, we say, okay, maybe this is gene 7, we add 1 to its count, and this is gene 100, and we add one to its count. So afterwards, after one billion, this is where this zero point, well actually it's 0 0.3 to one billion paired end reads. So basically what the sequencer is, is sample, doing is sampling from the space of transcripts from a sample and reporting what genes uh, well, it doesn't report what genes it hits. It reports the sequence that, it's, that it finds, and we use that sequence to identify what gene that hits, okay? And then at the end of the day, what that ends up looking like is this. So if this is the, this is the, um, the truth, right, okay? If in our sample, gene 1 has eight copies of, of itself, and gene 2 has three transcripts, and gene 3 has 50, 
and there's no uh, copies of, of gene zero, and maybe 100 copies of gene, I don't know, there's 20,000 genes, let's say 100. We want to estimate those numbers. So this is the truth. And we don't know that, right? This is, this is not for us mortal humans, right? This is just the God-given truth that we're trying to infer. So when we do this process, what we're effectively doing is um, estimating a count matrix. So we count how many times each gene was hit. So every time the sequencer produces a paired end read that aligned to gene one in the human genome, we get plus one. And we would do this for a sample one. So that gives us 20,000 estimates, one for every gene of the number of transcripts in sample one. And then we would repeat this for, sam for sample two and repeat it for sample three. And we would repeat it for all 1,200 of our samples. And what we get then here is this matrix. And this matrix represents an estimation of how much each gene is being expressed. Now, we don't expect to be exact, right? We, you know, the, the true copy number, whoops, the true copy number is, is something that we can only estimate. Um, and I should point out that it's possible that a sequencer um, sequences multiple parts of the same transcript, so these numbers won't be exact. But the, the point is, is that, that should give you a pretty, these numbers should give you a pretty good relative assessment of how much gene is being expressed at the cell at that moment when it was harvested. Okay, so finally then, why would we want to do that? Why do we want to measure how much gene is being expressed across all genes? And the answer, I think, is essentially that, you know, by looking at those genes that are highly or lowly expressed compared to normal or control, we can identify those cellular processes and molecular responses, those pathways that are particularly active or repressed at that moment in those cells. And that might give us an indication of what that cell was doing, how it was coping, how it was surviving. You know, was it using, uh, what processes was it using to evade, um, you, know, um, you know, the low nutrient toxic environment uh, or the hypoxic environment, et cetera. And um, that in turn gives us basically an idea into how tumors progress. So that's the idea of transcriptomics. Now, of course, um, it's limited. We, we're not measuring protein directly. And of course, proteins are the business end of biology, but um, uh, it's an intermediate. And because sequencing has become so cheap and ubiquitous, it gives us a, a quick way and comprehensive, complete way of looking into uh, um, what's going on in a tumor. We're back in the presentation here. These are the two uh, YouTube videos that I was speaking about. I highly recommend both. Uh, yeah, um, also here, this is a nice figure that describes how the cost of sequencing has dropped. And you can see this massive drop off around 2007. And then um, uh, you can see it just basically leveled out and costing nothing. At, um, uh, 2015 or so. Uh, it's a massive improvement. We think that it costs something like a hundred million dollars uh, for a complete genome, one human genome in 2001. Okay, so, right. So, there you go. We sequence all our tumor cohort that these days that might be, I don't know, a thousand individuals. Um, uh, there's a recent Scandinavian paper, Swedish to be more precise, uh, where they sequenced 7,000 women um, and other efforts underway that are uh, basically trying to um, sequence all women with breast cancer. And it's not just breast cancer, I should say, it's um, many different cancers. So what do you do with all that data? Um, and that leads to this idea of TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. This was a, a U.S. project started around 2006, I believe. Okay, and um, to date, they've profiled about 20,000 tumors across 33 different cancer types. I, I would really highly recommend spending five or ten minutes at the TCGA website 
to just read a little bit about what it is. Um, it's a, actually, I think, a huge milestone in, in cancer uh, research. It has so many nice things about it. Um, firstly, by bringing together researchers across many different cancers, 33, uh, you're able to compare across those different cancers at the informatics level. That wasn't easy to do or so easy to do before something like TCGA. Also, it allowed these, these consortia really, this consortium really to, to um, define rigorous experimental procedures. As all of you guys know from being in the lab, um, you know, protocol is everything. So, uh, you know, you can't have uh, um, 33 different centers uh, on 33 different cancers using different methods to, sample, uh, to sequence their tumors or to annotate them. Everything has to be very, bookkeeping has to be perfect and the experimental work has to be perfect for this to work. And uh, I think it's why the you know, TCJ is so powerful. And you can see here a little bit about the different cancers that were profiled like lung. Um, and we're gonna focus on breast here, this uh, pink. Okay. So, um, each tumor sample has a rich array of clinical and pathological lifestyle information associated with it. We're going to look at a subset of that. And each um, tumor is profiled not just with um, transcriptomes, transcriptomics, gene expression, but actually um, they've also been fully sequenced, they're, they're the cancer genome by DNA sequence. There's methylation profiles. Uh, so these are small, you know, basically um, well, epigenetic studies, and we'll talk about that more in the COVE course. And some protein and proteomics have been done to the samples, amongst other things. In fact, I think the next slide um, shows a little bit more about that. And this data is completely publicly available and can be used by researchers to explore cancer. Uh, there's a caveat there that the DNA sequencing, for example, requires permission. And that's because it gets into issues of ethics that by having their DNA sequence, these, the, the patients who contributed tumor, tumors, their DNA is then on file for everybody to see. And that you know has certain ethical um, implications that are very important. And we'll talk a little bit more of those as the course goes along. So um, we're gonna look at a miniaturization of the TCJ data set. We're only gonna look at, um, at uh, the transcriptom transcriptomic profiling here, okay? Um, there's lots of other things available like DNA methylation. Uh, we're also going to use the clinical data, a subset of it, because it's, it's massive. Um, you can see here that there's other information like ATAC-seq, uh, microRNA-seq, these things, um, genotyping arrays for um, SNPs, the polymorphisms in the um, tumors, all sorts of crazy stuff. And so it's really a, a beautiful, beautiful collection of data sets, but we're going to pick and choose. So we're going to we're going to focus on transcriptomics today but if you wanted to look at the epigenetics or the genomics or you know all the phenotypes that you see under the microscope the pathology basically it's all there and you're welcome to go to the gdc and download the data yourself and get it into r and go to town i've logged in to r studio cloud as my favorite student, I am Deadpool. So this is what you're gonna see, something close to it. Now, if you're not sure how to get here, I would recommend going back to the previous lecture where I described how to go to Slack and get the link to the data science for biology um, uh, workspace, okay? And yeah, see, I am now, I have my private workspace, but don't forget you need to switch to your data science for biology. Now I've made a second project available to everybody called uh, Cancer Transcriptomes for Lecture 3. That's today's lecture. And when I click on that, you'll see that you're gonna have to wait for a few seconds for it to deploy the project. Now remember this temporary project flashing up here, you need to save a permanent copy. Um, I'm not entirely sure why it's done that way. I think it's so that you can uh, look at a project, but not necessarily have it count towards your workspace until you're sure you want it. So let's do that right now. Um, I saved it. So now we're here and you can see now if we go to our files project, uh, I, I have basically what I've promised in most projects would, would be. And uh, in particular, I could go to examples here 
and I can open this file. So this is a small set of, uh, it's a small R script. And well, you'll trust me here. This is the R script that, um, uh, these are all the R code that I used in the slides I'm gonna show you in a few minutes. Now, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna load the tidyverse so I can copy and I can paste it into my R window. Recall, this is the editor and this is the R session. Okay, so, and then there's gonna be some output here saying attaching packages, blah, 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 uh, some conflicts, let's not worry about those now. Okay, what the library function is, it's called a function because it has these parentheses here, round brackets. You can think of the tidyverse as being a book on your bookshelf behind your desk. The library function is equivalent to you getting up, grabbing the book and opening it up on your desk. In other words, like that's like poetry for saying that you're making that book accessible to R. Now tidyverse is a package, not a book. And a package is basically a collection of recipes for getting something done. In our case, the tidyverse contains a lot of functions that are called ggplot that are really uh, convenient for drawing beautiful graphs and plots. And that's what we're gonna explore today. So basically, when you say library tidyverse, what you're doing is you're uh, loading um, a bunch of recipes for making plots. Then um, you're going to uh, um, do these two functions that I'm not gonna go over too much right now, but here what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm gonna set my working directory. Let's not worry about that too much. I'm just pointing R to the right folder, and then I'm going to load my data. So I can put both of those things at the same time, and it takes a few seconds to load, I believe. Now, well, not too much. Okay, so already you see that if you're in your environment tab here, that suddenly there's this thing that pops up called small BRCA. And there's 1,200 observations on 79 variables. Okay, whatever that means. But this load function, what it does, is it basically loads a file from the directory called data. Now, if I go to data over here, I'll see that there's a small underscore bracket dot R data. This matches this here. And I've loaded that file into memory. Think of it as basically loading a file into Excel. And this now is a variable in our environment. A side note here, it's called BRCA. That's TCA, TCGA's code for breast BR cancer CA. Now a really convenient function in R is the view function. So I can take a quick look at that file using by typing in view small bracket and I get what looks like a spreadsheet. And I can go through that spreadsheet and actually there's 79 columns. Um, there's actually in reality in the full data set there's probably close to 500 columns and I just selected um, the most pertinent um, attributes. And this is clinical data. This is to go back to what I was talking about earlier. This is the type of information that the clinician and the pathologist would give about the tumor. Okay, the staining, the lifestyle and interventions. And at the end of it is um, 50 genes uh, that are known breast cancer um, players. Okay, so they're all well established as playing a role in breast cancer genesis and progression. Now, the full data set has over 20,000 such genes. I've just selected 50 to make this a reasonable size. And the rows here are individual samples. I don't wanna say patients because some patients have more than one sample and you might wanna reflect on why that would be the case. Why would a patient have more than one sample? How many in total? Well, I won't scroll all the way down but I know from over here that's about 1,215 patients. And this is called a tibble, all right? And you can think of tibble as being what you might think as, as an Excel spreadsheet, if you like, okay? It's a way of, of grouping a lot of data together in a nice, convenient way, okay? So now, the rest of, uh, of this presentation, basically, you can go to our studio in your session and you can copy and paste in lines from this file, uh, lecture03.r. And I'm gonna go back to slides and show you um, what each of these, these uh, functions and calls do. Um, so now you would just basically say, uh, you'd copy this say, and recall the semicolon means you can type in more than one command on the line, 
here I'll just look at one of them and I paste this in. Dim is a function that gives me the dimensions of my tibble, my, my data structure, small bracket. And not surprisingly, the dimensions here, 1,200 patients by 79 variables is the same as up here. And I can ask for the number of rows. That's a function called n row. And I'll see this 1215. And the number of columns, well, no surprise. Okay. And I can ask for what are the names of the columns, right? What are the, now if I go to my view, where did my view go? Hmm. I'm going to do this again. View small brca. Um, you'll notice that the columns have different labels on them. Uh, TSS, that's the, um, the site that sequenced the patient, the participant, that's their code, their, a barcode that TCGA used to store all of it, when they completed their forms, their gender, their menopausal status, all sorts of variables that we'll look at a little bit as we go along. Race, ethnicity, um, tumor status, whether they're alive or they're dead. Um, if, they're, if they have died, it tells you the number of days that they survived post-diagnosis of breast cancer. Um, there's some technical things like the pathologist, what did they, what did they believe the tumor type is, okay? Um, their year that they were diagnosed, their age at diagnosis, whether micrometastases were detected. So micrometastases are very uh, just a few cells that remain, for example, post-surgery, basically things that are missed by the, by the surgeon. Um, lymph nodes, uh, we talked a little bit about those already, um, I believe. So basically whether they're positive or negative and how many lymph nodes and many other things that, um, that, uh, that we have here. And I, I could look at their, I could get a list of all the um, columns by using the call names function that lists everything. And you can see the 50 genes that I've chosen are at the end of that list. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to the, um, the slides and go through some more functionality. But just know that you can go in here and you can use RStudio Cloud anytime to step through this lecture, have the slides open in one window and RStudio open in the other and experiment as you're listening. So now we start to really do data science. Uh, you know, the goal here uh, is to turn data into knowledge and that's really corny, but it's not trivial to do when you have a high dimensional highly structured data set that's tons of numbers and symbols, um, you, where do you start? And I think we're going to see that visualization is uh, the cornerstone of data science and is an excellent tool for giving us those first insights, those ability to, to generate the first hypotheses that we can follow up and validate as we go along. Okay, so let's start with a scatter plot to look at the um, mRNA abundances of um, our famous ER and HER2 genes. Okay, a couple things right off the top that are really annoying but fundamental to bioinformatics is that I've been talking about ER as a protein, the estrogen receptor, but the official gene name is ESR1, okay? And HER2, really weirdly, the official gene name for it is ERB2 because it comes from the most gene. I don't know exactly the history of why that is the case, but here in my plot, I'm going to look at um, ESR1 expression, I'll call it expression. It's the number of times reads uh, the sequencer um, sequence fragments of the ESR1 transcriptome. Uh, and along this axis, it's the number of times that um, uh, uh, the, the, the sequencer read fragments of uh, the HER2 gene, okay? All right, so let's break this down. This is a function called ggplot. Now, it's for graphics, okay? And the first thing we do is we're going to tell ggplot where the data is that we're going to use. And not surprisingly, it's in this tibble called small bracket, okay? That's the only data structure we have right now anyway, so that's where our information is, okay? And then... Um, that's the base object. We can think of ggplot as where it all begins, okay? And then we have this plus operator. 
Now, plus is a way of ask, uh, us adding a layer to the plot. Okay, so ggplot, the way that um, the power of ggplot is a, it's what's called a grammar of graphs, right? It's kind of poetic, but it, it means that it provides a way to um, add successive layers as the more we want of information to display. And so here, um, we're adding something called a geom point. Geom is short for geometric, but that doesn't really matter. Geometric object point is because we're looking at a scatter plot. So each point here, what does that point correspond to? Well, that's defined by this thing called a mapping. And that mapping uh, has what's called an aesthetic. Now, don't get freaked out. This is kind of complicated. I just want you to understand uh, the intuition here and it'll kind of become more natural as we go along. So we're saying by point, we're saying, okay, we want points. What are the points supposed to represent? We're saying, well, it should be X along the X axis. It should be the count of the number of times the sequencer read part of, a tra of the ESR1 transcript. So for example, this patient here, almost, uh, let's say 68,000 times the sequencer read part of the ESR1 transcript in that patient. Now, that doesn't mean that there's 68,000 transcripts in the cell. It just means that there is some true number of transcripts, right? And the, the, which was probably not, but can't be bigger than 68,000, but the sequencer might uh, read different fragments of the same transcript, right? Okay. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at this ERB2, which is the official name for HER2. And so the same patient that was like 68,000 copies of um, ESR, uh, well, 68,000 reads hitting the ESR1 transcript, about 200,000 reads um, hit the uh, um, RB2 transcript. How many points should be here? Well, every patient or every sample should donate one point to this plot. So there's going to be uh, 1,215 points in this plot, right? Okay. So well, already, that's kind of interesting. Now, you know, if you're interested in breast cancer like I am, you, you know, you say, okay, that's, that already tells me something. It, like, a lot aren't expressing either ESR1 or ERB2. That's, um, there's a thousand points, and they're kind of all mixed in there. And I, I don't like the size of those points, but they're too big. So I can't really get an idea of how many points are in there. But there's times where HER2 is highly expressed, and there are times when ESR1 is highly expressed, but there's not many in, in our sample set, at least of 1,200 samples, where both are expressed. Now, these guys are candidates there, but it's not radical expression. These guys are very highly, like that's 800,000 times the sequencer read a part of a um, HER2 uh, transcript. So it's likely that HER2 is very, the transcript is very highly expressed in that sample. And likewise down here. Now notice these are not the same uh, axes, the, the dimensionality has shifted here. This is from zero to 200,000, and this is from zero to 800,000. So that's a little bit um, disorienting too, and maybe something we would want to fix. But first things first, let's um, start to play around. And now, this is exactly the same thing as you saw uh, on the previous slide. I just don't like the black points, so I'm going to turn them to blue. And actually, I can use... Um, any color I want. R understands most of your primary colors. If you want fancy colors, you can use what's called hex, which is just basically a, a code. And, and you can, this link here, I won't use it right now for time reasons, but you can get, you can make any color you want, okay, any color. And I'm going to reduce the size. This 0.1 means 0.1 of a millimeter. So the points are much smaller. And now you can start to see that from, oh, let me go back. So here, I can't really differentiate what the density is there, but now with a bit smaller points, I see there's a bit of resolution. Okay, so there's a lot of points that are really close to zero on both, right? Although it's, you know, even at 25,000 uh, transcripts this way, and what is that? That's 50,000 in HER2. It's still a lot of reads hitting ESR1 in HER2. So I wouldn't say that they're not expressed in those samples. It's just not abnormally high like these guys up here okay now I want to point out here is that this is exactly the same as the previous slide but I, there's two things here 
I've added this color is equal to blue and size is equal to 0 0.1. There's a third thing called shape, and you can explore that on your own time. But here, I think it's self-explanatory what they do. But notice that I didn't include them within the aesthetic. Okay. Now, the aesthetic, this AES, it has a parenthesis that goes from here to here. If I had put them inside those parentheses, if I moved this guy, this parenthesis, down, if I got rid of this guy, this guy here, okay, if I deleted that and I moved it down here instead and included these guys within there, I'd get a very different result. And that's something for you to experiment with down the road. But for now, I just want to point out that, that there's that subtle difference that makes a big difference. The subtle difference in the code makes a big difference in the visualization, and you'll understand why in a bit. Okay, so aesthetic mappings, that's this AES, it's short for aesthetic. So um, this part here is just like it was before. We're just saying that base layer, we're saying, we're telling our, we're gonna use small bracket as our data set, okay? And then we're gonna add another layer. And like before, it's still a scatter plot, so it's points. And it's still ESR1 by RB2 as before, that hasn't changed. The size doesn't change, and because it's outside of the um, parenthesis, you'll see all the points are now um, the same size, right? That, so basically, by leaving it outside the aesthetic, all the points are um, are, are uh, treated that way. Here, the color has moved inside the parenthesis, and so now I've added a third dimension to my two-dimensional plot. On this, the first dimension, I have ESR1, X. Second dimension, Y, I have RB2. And my third dimension is color. And that's going to be colored by tumor here. Either it, the sample reflects tumor or it reflects something called match normal. Now, I haven't talked about this before. But in fact, some of these samples are actually not tumor, but they're from morphologically normal looking tumor uh, tissue close to the tumor. So the surgeon, when they were in, she basically took a little bit of uh, tissue from outside of the tumor margin. And um, that can be used as a sort of control. Okay, it's common. So not all of our samples have matched normal, but some of them do. I think in our data sets, it, it's around 150. And so here you can see that the matched normals all have very low, well, have the lowest, again, I'm not sure what the absolute, kind of these, some of them are very, very low, but these are the lowest, amongst the lowest uh, samples of the lowest ESR1 and HER2 expression. And I think actually that's what we would expect because both ESR1 and HER2 are oncogenes and you wouldn't expect them to be super highly expressed in, in, in healthy tissue. So already we've discovered something, okay? All right, so recall, I got this by adding as a third dimension and now it basically, now the tumor, it, R goes to that attribute. This is a column in the small BRCA um, uh, tibble. There's a column called tumor. As an exercise, I, I recommend you find that column in the view or, um, by scrolling through the data set, you'll see that there's a column called tumor. It, true means that it's um, tumor, and false means it's match normal. So now I've included a third dimension. Um, here, uh, I can change it up, and this is exactly the same as before, except, um, well, I made my the size a little bit bigger here uh, because I used, um, in this case, race. And whereas tumor just had tumor and normal, this has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different classes, so including not available and, and not evaluated, you can see here that the vast majority of the data set looks to be basically white. Um, and I think already this tells you something. You know, note that the, the scatter plot for the first two dimensions, X and Y doesn't change, but when I put race in here, I needed to make the points a bit bigger to see the colors, but you can see that, um, well, for instance here, uh, excuse me, the, um, I think these are Asian. Um, Two Asian samples are amongst the most extreme. I think there's actually three, two, two, two dots there. Um, but I wouldn't say um, 
there's a striking relationship between uh, um, race and um, and the expression of these two genes. Uh, it is interesting, I think, that there could be an enrichment here um, for non-white people in the tail, right? Um, uh, if 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 ninety percent of your data set is is white, then even a few outliers like that, it could be statistically um, significant shift, and and that might actually make some sense, given what we know about breast cancer, um, and uh, in um, not in North America, uh, but it's beyond the scope of our conversation here. Um, and we talked a little bit in a previous slide about the TNM staging. Oops, this is cut off a little bit, but this says AGC pathological tumor stage. Again, I invite you to go into um, our studio cloud, into the small BRCA tibble and try to find that column. And so all patients are labeled as stage one through, in this case here, there's stage 10. I'm not sure what that even means, but stage four and the stage X. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Um, Okay, right. This is interesting because now I've added a fourth dimension to my uh, data set, right? This is um, kind of cool because I have X and Y as before. Now I use shape here for the tumor, okay? So shape, on here you can see in the legend, a triangle means it's a tumor and a circle means that it's a normal. Unfortunately, you know, they're in here, those normals, but you can't see them. So that's not the greatest plot, I have to admit. Um, you can't really see that resolution, but we know those normals are down there. The color here is used as a fourth dimension to label the patients by their stage. And well, I'm not too convinced you can see too much here. I think these guys are high stage, right? Um, these guys down here look to be relatively low stage. Um, so, and then it looks pretty scattered amongst the rest of them. Um, I think it looks a bit, I would say it looks a bit noisy. This is not the greatest plot that I've ever made. So let's address that. Here, um, uh, I can use facets to basically simplify my plots. Facets are pretty cool and you can make these things in like no time once you got the hang of it. So here, um, the facets partition the data um, now, it's still ESR1 on the x-axis and HER2 on the y-axis, but now for every level of the um, AGCC pathologic tumor stage, it creates a separate plot. So if you recall from the previous slide, we have discrepancy, not available, stage one, etc. Now it spreads these guys over, discrepancy, not available, st stage one. Actually, there's very few patients that were labeled as discrepancy or not available, so or NA. So basically, for some reason, we don't have that information from the database. You can see there's a lot of patients in stage one, stage two, um, not so much in stage two, but 2A and 2B. I'm not really sure exactly what stage two and A, a and B are. Um, presumably, there are refinements of stage two, but uh, or different possibilities. Let's not worry too much about those definitions right now. It's just basically to say is that now you can see a little bit better into the structure of the data. We have a few stage fours, all these stage, this interesting is stage X, which I'm not even sure what it is, doesn't seem to express HER2 at all, a potentially interesting observation. Um, now, how did I do this? Okay, before, um, before trying to interpret the plot anymore, Let's go through our, our code up here. Same as before, still uh, a point, right? Now I've added a wrap, this facet wrap. So notice that I've added another layer to the plot, okay? Now this layer here is just like before, X and Y, and color is our tumor, so um, versus normal, right? So you can see that. Um, um, okay. And then um, size is one, it's outside, so all points are size one. But here, the um, facets, each one of these is called a facet, and I have, what is it, 15 of them. So I've split them four a row, that's, that's easy to understand. If I had said three, and row is equal to three, number of rows, then that would have forced, I guess, like five, is that right? Uh, if 
5 times 3 is 15, yeah. So I would have had 5 plots on each row here, okay? Uh, now, the most confusing thing here is this guy, this tilde. I think we understand why um, we're using AGC pathologic tumor stage, because that's an attribute in our tibble, right, as before. So that I think this part you understand. This tilde here is a special symbol in R. Let me make this a little bit bigger. It's this tilde, right? And that represents, that tilde represents um, a formula. And for now, just, um, just know that facet wrap requires that tilde, okay? And let's not worry about it too much. But basically, you're, you're providing a formula to ggplot to, uh, to, that de defines how you're going to partition up your mapping into separate facets. Okay, so I want to point out here, I mean, I think that it's pretty impressive how far we've got. I'm not sure that this figure tells me anything about the biology that I didn't already know. That's okay. I mean, I've already, we've already had a few nice slides that um, you know, identified some interesting things and some questions. You can start to see like, well, for example, stage X, I don't know what that is. I'd have to go and do some reading. Why is it only expressed in the ESR? Uh, why are those tumors only expressing ESR1 but never HER2? I mean, it would be interesting to go and investigate that. So you can see how the data science here, the visualization of data science, really very, very powerfully suggests hypothesis and how to you know, dissect your data. We're, we're really making big progress here. Okay, so um, still, I'm not really convinced about the relationship between TNM state, TNM staging, ER, and HER2. As a side note here, this is actually a lot of uh, data scientists who look at breast cancer data have this uh, found the same thing, um, which is interesting to consider why that might be the case. But here, I, I change it up and I use histological type. So histological type is like... Um, what the pathologist sees when they look under the microscope in terms of the macro structure of the tumor. Um, for example, here, we talked at the beginning about um, tumors that start, start in the duct versus in the lobules, right? So those, the lobules are at the end and the ducts are the tubes that deliver the milk. And then there's other kinds of uh, breast cancer like medullary, metaplastic carcinoma. So those are um, the mucinous car carcinoma. I'm not actually sure what many of these things are, but you notice there's very few of those samples in our data set. The vast majority are infiltrating ductal carcinoma, a significant infiltrating lobular carcinoma. Now, already there, I think that you see something pretty interesting because there's a few, you know, highly expressing HER2, but IDC, the infiltrating ductal carcinoma, excuse me, seems to have many more HER2 positive tumors. And these mixed histology, mucinous carcinomas, et cetera, almost never uh, express HER2. Now, that's a finding, right? That's a, an important observation. Well, what we found is something that's been known for a while, that HER2 tends to be a player in infiltrating ductal carcinoma and less so in lobular carcinoma. But, you know, we've done this in the space of a few minutes, uh, not even a half an hour of... Um, uh, of data science, okay? Um, so uh, we could switch, switch it up a little bit, and let's look at the expression of GRAB7 and ERB2. Um, they show correlation in their expression, and it makes sense because actually they sit uh, on the same chromosome very close to one another. It's a good um, bioinformatic challenge for you to figure out what chromosome they're on, what database did you use to find that out. Now, they're, now they sit very close together. On, they sit very close to each other on the same chromosome, and in breast cancer, that region of the chromosome tends to become duplicated or amplified. So that region actually gets copied sometimes 30 to 50 times. Okay, and because now you have 30 to 50 times as many genes in the uh, the genome, you get 30 to 50 times the amount of expression of GRAB7 and HER2. Um, and since HER2 is a growth factor, that's bad news, and it may underlie why HER2 tumors are so powerful. Okay, so 
if I plot their expression here, I see a pretty good correlation. I, I see the variance getting pretty big, but you can definitely see that there's an upward trend here between as ERB2, or HER2 expression increases, so does GRAB7. But, you know, that's really interesting. But what we're interested in is the trend. Okay, I should say before leaving this slide that this is all standard, nothing new. X, Y, and color are my three dimensions, right? That's, you've seen that now. That's old hat for you. Um, but this is new. So if I smooth, here I've changed from point to smooth. I no longer have a scatter plot per se, but I have a curve. Now I have two curves, in fact, one for the normal samples that's in the uh, red and green um, for the tumor samples. And this is basically now a fit, okay, to the data. And so we don't see the individual points. What we see is the trend. Now you could ask, what's the shading, right? Why does this? And there's two things here. The shading is a confidence interval. It's like basically trying to say, what is the, the vast majority of points fall between um, these two uh, bounds in the area of the gray. Um, and you'll notice that the variance, right? That's your variance. How far you tend away from the mean or the predicted value increases as you go up in expression levels, which kind of makes sense, I guess, in a way. Now, if we wanted to do, uh, we can change it up. And if I, if I don't want to use color, I could use something else called line type. So you notice here, this is the same as before. But on the previous slide, I used color, and now I have color separating um, my tumor classes. Here, I change to line type, and R fills in these different shapes of lines or, or patterns of lines is a better word, sorry. Okay, so it, you know, ggplot has all sorts of nice functions like this and, and parameters, arguments that allow you to really kind of change things up and make, what, make it look the way you want. All right. If I want to look at both the points and the smoothing, which is smart to do, um, you can uh, just add another layer, right? So again, this idea of layers, the bottom layer is just like we've seen a million times now, old hat. That's the data we're using. The genome point is what we were using before. The point says, I want to see the points on that scatter plot. And smooth is adding the last layer, another plus. See, there's two pluses here, that other plus. And now it's adding the, um, the curves with their fits. So lots of flexibility. Okay, so um, the next concept is of statistical transformations. And we're going to be ending with uh, basically with these slides here. So we're almost at the end, guys. Hold on a couple more minutes. So lymph node status has long been used by clinicians to measure how far a tumor has, pro um, has progressed. So they count the number of positive lymph nodes. So that basically they sample with a needle and they, um, they come back and they look for cancer cells in the lymph nodes of the patients. The idea is that if there's no cancer cells in the lymph nodes, it's a good sign, um, then they're called negative. And if they're positive uh, in lymph nodes, well, that's, a bad, you know, that's not a good sign because it means the tumor, uh, the cancer cells have escaped, you know, the duct and are getting into the lymph system. Um, I have a question for you. What does the, what do what are lymphatics do, and do you understand what lymphatics are? That's something you could look up. Um, they they pay particular attention to the sentinel lymph node. That's the lymph node that's closest to the tumor. But generally, they just count how many um, lymph nodes in the patient are positive. So here, I've switched from a scatter plot to a bar plot, and bar plots are interesting and they they tell a different story. So here you'll see that this part is just like before. The data I'm using hasn't changed. I am using a bar plot now, that's changed. I have a mapping because I always have a mapping. And then I need my aesthetic. What describes my dimensions? But here notice, there's only one dimension, it's 1D. And that's the number of lymph nodes examined count. Now, again, I invite you to go back to the, um, into our studio, look at the Tibble small bracket and find that column called lymph nodes examined. What it is, is a number that ranges from not available, like for some reason we don't have it, or NA. So we don't have that data. And there's, there's a lot of patients that don't have any data on their lymph node status. I, I don't know why. And then one, this is the number, that means that there's something like 90 patients that had one positive lymph node. 
there's um, uh, something like um, 120 that have two lymph nodes. Three, there's about um, 75 that have uh, three positive lymph nodes, etc. And I think the maximum number here is something like 44, and there's a couple patients that had 44 pos positive lymph nodes. That's uh, pretty astounding, actually, that they had so many. Now, you'll notice here that the x-axis, it's not very pretty, right? Because it put 1, then 10, then 11, 2, then 20, then 21, 3 here, and 4 here. But really, you want probably 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, 10, you know, 20, 30, 40. You want to reorder. Now, you can reorder that x-axis, but we're not going to do that today. I think you still get the idea here is that... Um, you know, you can see the distribution across your 1,200 patients, minus those that you don't have information for. I guess it's about 15% of the patients we don't have data on. But you can see that there is variability there, right? And um, But there are some really astounding cases. There's quite a few that have 10 to 20 positive lymph nodes, okay? So, you know, something really subtle went on here, though, because in, in the chapter in the book, uh, in Chapter 3, they, just, they, they talk about this some more, and we'll come back to it, is th that um, ggplot, the genome bar layer, it summarized the data. So it went through all 1,200 patients, and it calculated that, you know, uh, 90 have, you know, one positive lymph node, and 75 have two positive lymph nodes, or sorry, 10 positive lymph nodes here, right? Okay, so it's done some calculation for you behind the scenes. Now, you can then do lots of stuff by adding more layers, right? So here, it's exactly as before, but now you'll see at the, whoops, I didn't, sorry, I didn't add more layers here. What I did was add more um, dimensions in the um, aesthetic. So before, you'll notice that the aesthetic had just one dimension. I've added a second dimension and here I've used fill, yet another option for making things you know, pretty. I've used the pathological tumor stage here, back to that. Now, I think that's really interesting, and it already tells a story. Note that the low stage guys, stage 1, stage uh, 1A, stage 1B, how prevalent they are in 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 lymph nodes, positivity. So those, those patients that had few lymph nodes, okay, they are often categorized as low stage. But when you go up to higher, like 21, 22, th these are a lot of lymph nodes, right, inside of here. 40, 43, 44, almost all of the patients are stage um, uh, two or above, okay, stage. Three. And you can see that stage 10, for example, does show up across the board, very low, mostly at these low levels and not in the high. So now, that's partly because it's how stage is defined, right? It's partly defined by lymph nodes. So we're not discovering something here, but, well, I want to stop you there for a second because what I just said is um, is really important. It's a, it, This is a sort of like a common in data science is that when you start to play and visualize, you look for properties in your data that should hold. For example, you know, if, if the definition of stage three is that it's invasive, and it's in the lymph nodes, then you would expect that patients with um, zero lymph nodes or one are not going to be classified as stage three, right? So you look for that in your data. Why is that important? Because often we're, we're concerned about the quality of our data. Did, this, did the profiling and the experiments and the preparation work? Is our database correct? So th these kinds of things tell us something about um, the correctness of our data too. Okay, so I think that you can start to see maybe a little bit about the power of programming. Now, it might be awkward to you, this is the first time you've ever programmed, to just jump into ggplot2 and, and type these things out. On the other hand, you, you know, we've made some pretty nice looking graphs that are almost like journal level uh, quality. So you can imagine that um, uh, a little bit more work with this and you'll be able to do some pretty fantastic graphs. And why a grammar? Because it's, it's, it's like ggplot's like a language within a language. It allows you to build up these layers and express yourself in, in nice ways. Now, 
How do I operate with ggplot2? I use it every day when I'm doing research, right? Um, what I do is I go online, mostly with Google, and I type in ggplot2 bar graphs or ggplot2 scatter plots or ggplot2 pie graph or something, and I look for examples on the web. And almost always, because the R community is so nice, such nice people, is they make that code available somehow. And then you take that code, you copy it locally, and um, you, uh, you play, right? And you try to get it working on your data set. So this is a great website called the, the R Graph Gallery, okay? And um, I go through here and I, I look for examples, like here's some histograms, right? And I look for some nice histograms and I say, oh yeah, like this is a nice histogram that shows two distributions colored well, or this histogram here combines a scatter plot with histograms. And I would click on this and I'll get the code for it and I'll start to modify it for my data. It's as simple as that. That's, uh, that's how we roll in, with R. Um, and that's, uh, I would highly recommend it. And, you know, cite where you found it, right? And, or even send an email to the people that made it and show them. And they're often very happy to, um, to uh, know that their stuff is being used. Okay, so here's some points of reflection that I'll leave to you to, uh, to consider. Uh, uh, this is pretty heavy lecture today in many ways. First time with our studio cloud and some genomics, etc. cetera. Uh, feel free, you know, I hope you come to the, the lecture time uh, to discuss this and also the lab time. We can go through sequencing technologies if you need more information about those. We can discuss these points of reflection. We can, um, you know, work on some examples together uh, and basically just hang out a bit and try to learn together. Okay, so thank you very much. And I really hope that you have a good time exploring some visualization. It's uh, really powerful. Okay, thank you.